Welcome to worship. My name is Mikhail. I get to serve as one of the pastors here, and I am here to celebrate, <laughs> to celebrate Trinity Sunday. This is the week that we recognize the mystery, the joy, and the, um, the awesomeness, the excitement, and the wonder of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. All around the world, the Christian church is celebrating and recognizing this day as we step into an experience of wonder that has been characterized throughout the centuries as a holy dance. And so as we gather together in worship, I invite you to lean in and experience this time of worship together as a dance with one another and with the Trinity. And so as part of that, we invite you to let us know that you're here. Type your name in the comments and keep the conversation going as we worship together so that we can be together. We invite you to sing. No, we can't necessarily hear one another, but we can do this together. We invite you to respond to the words that we say and that we say together. And we invite you to lean in all the more to experience the fullness of this Trinitarian God who reaches out in relationship with us. So would you join us now as we gather and worship together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly hosts. Praise God.
this place we welcome you in come jesus come come like the rain hope in the sky show us your face oh lord we wait as our praises rise may your praise
Let us pray together. So Father, Son, and Spirit, we praise you. Lord, we ask that you, that holy love, would fill our hearts and our minds and spirits so that we might be people to reflect you. Lord, as we continue in worship, open our eyes and our ears to see and hear all that is good and all that is you. We love you. Amen. Hi, my name is Juliana Guile, and today I'm coming to you from our dining room in Deniston Park. Today we are not gathering in the same physical space, but we are gathering. The words will be on your screen, so I invite you to say your part out loud so we can all know we're saying them together. We gather here to tell the truth. We don't have our lives together, and on our own, we can't get them together. We confess that we are poor and we are hungry and thirsty for what we cannot provide ourselves. We need God's grace, and we need each other. We gather here to tell the truth that while we were still sinners, God died in solidarity with us, and now you and I are forgiven, set free, and adopted into a good family. You and I are not alone. We belong to God and to one another. We are God's people, people who are rich and satisfied, a people of peace, reconciliation, and love. So today we gather here to tell the truth. Our lives are better when we are neighbors. We are not all the same, but we are ready for transformation. We gather here to tell the truth. We will be a spiritual community of hope and transformation that lives the way of Jesus. Right now, we are practicing being good neighbors, even as we take on the challenges of social distancing in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. But we want to make sure that distance does not create isolation. So for the next three minutes, we are going to practice being good neighbors by checking in with at least one other person. As always, we want to remember to include our kids in this, in this especially now as they are away from their friends. You can send a message to a kid through his or her parents, or if you don't have their parents' contact, send it to Pastor Hope. So, with these things in mind, let's take a second to ask God to give you a name or two to check in with right now. If a person comes to mind that you do not have contact information for, you can send it to Pastor Chris or Pastor Mikkel, and they will pass it on. Now, for the next three minutes, write a short message expressing that this person is on your mind. Ask how they are doing and how you can be praying for and or supporting them right now. Everyone ready to practice being good neighbors? Okay, go.
Each week in worship, we get to hear one another's stories. And during this time of um, social distancing and online worship, it's been all the more important that we get to have a window into each other's lives. But not only each other's lives, each of our stories also offers a window of how each of us as individuals are seeing God's work and uh, get to participate in God's work during this time that we are apart. And so I invite you now to hear and listen, really to listen to the story and the words of our storyteller today coming from us, uh, from Joel and Corbin Fries. Hey, hey everyone, we are the Friezes. I am Joel, and what's your name? Finley. And this is Finley. And Corbin is not able to be with us. She is a little under the weather this morning, so I will read a portion for her. We are coming to you from our patio in Northwest Oklahoma City. And we are here because we want to live into the unsettling way of Jesus. Just a quick update on our quarantine experience. I am a physical therapist and a professor at Southern Nazarene University. So we experienced a lot of um, stress in the early adjustment uh, during the academic year. Uh, we we're strategically planning out Zoom meetings and work times as we we're both working from home and uh, dealing with this pedal the metal two-year-old right here. We did find peace knowing that many of us were going through this together, and we also have um, fully accepted the gift of getting to spend so much unexpected time during this developmental age uh, in Finley's life. It's given us time to also read and reflect on what matters most. Corbin and I recently read The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and have picked up some habits that uh, John Mark Comer talks about in that book one of which is incorporating a true Sabbath into our daily or our weekly routine now. So this is helping us build, um, experience rest and build spiritual habits that we hope to last long after we return to whatever the new normal looks like. Over the last three months, I've seen God most in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic from the world rallying around frontline workers, both in the front, but also in the back, uh, backstage. I've seen people from our congregation hand out food to those in need. I've seen people in our congregation raise money for the food bank. I've had many people reach out to me personally and offer prayers, which has meant so much to me and our family. Over the last uh, three months, I've also had the pleasure of serving on the church board. I am very grateful and humbled to be able to have a seat at the table with so many people that I admire so highly. <clears throat> I, uh, these meetings have given me insight into the hearts of our leaders. I most admire their patience, sensitivity, humility, and discernment. I know that kingdom work is all that we are concerned with, and I appreciate the courage to follow wherever he leads. So now I'm going to read Corbin's portion. As a mom and a social worker, during the past couple months of COVID, I have learned that working closely with the juvenile justice system virtually can be frustrating and at times seem unjust as they make decisions over a computer screen that impact individuals' lives. On the other hand, I've had the privilege of seeing children reunified with their families during a pandemic, and I've seen children find their forever families through adoption after years of feeling unwanted. By spending t additional time with Finley, I've been reminded of what great teachers children's are, children are in our lives if we just allow ourselves to be still enough to see it. We would learn quite a bit about Jesus himself. Lastly, I've been working through the workbook, Me and My White Supremacy, and I've been, never been called out in the necessary ways that this book has. It has increased my self-awareness and provided me with needed self-examination. I would never have thought I was, that I was attributing to systemic racism, and yet I have been. I don't feel it is right to do this story told without confessing that at times we are not present or aware enough to acknowledge that we are slipping into the comfort of our whiteness which consequently negatively affects black, indigenous, and all people of color's lives. It is inexcusable. We have had the privilege of choosing when to speak up and when to remain silent. For all of this, we are deeply sorry. We acknowledge we are not experts, and we have a lot of learning and unlearning to do. As a family, we commit to listen well and intentionally, to speak up when we hear or see acts of racism, to not just stand in solidarity with you, but to fight for justice alongside you. Because of all of that, our desire for the 8th Street Church 
is for us to be a church that is not just outraged by black deaths, but also takes better care of black lives. Through my field of work, she is a social worker, I have learned that racial segregation is still very much a thing and predominantly black neighborhoods are not cared for in the ways in which white ones are. May we get involved in local and nationwide politics that focus on caring for systemic change by bridging the racial gap of fair wage, lower the unjust incarceration rates of people of color, increase fair access to housing, fair accessibility to transportation and food, and ultimately a society that strives for equity for all. And then let me leave um, with this prayer that our family has for the 8th Street Church. Our prayer for the 8th Street Church over the coming months is that we seek him first in all we do. I pray we have courage to take sides when a side needs to be taken. I pray that our politics are that of a different kingdom, regardless which side of the aisle that falls on. I pray for our pastoral staff as they navigate a challenging year. I am grateful for the courage they have shown, and I pray for comfort, energy, rest, and boldness and thought as they lead us in transformation. Thank you guys for taking a, a stand and speaking out on injustices over recent weeks. It is refreshing to see our pastors speak on behalf of a congregation to denounce injustice and call it by name. Lastly, we pray for anyone in our congregation that has been a recipient of racism and other social injustices. Thank you for letting us share our story. Joel and Corbin and Finley, thank you so very much for sharing with us from your heart and for your prayers. We pray that your prayers for our church are answered. And I think you have given many of us words to use and to agree with as we walk through these days together. Um, in this time, we invite you now to pause. Um, in a moment, we will pray and continue in worship. And really, we are continuing in worship even when we give. But we want to give an opportunity now to give online. And uh, this is a way that we participate in worship by saying, I want to be a part of this. Um, in the coming days and weeks and months, we will continue to share with you needs that we are hearing about and learning about throughout um, this time, both of COVID-19, but also the uh, protests and move towards social justice that we need in our communities. And because of your faithfulness and generosity, we continue to be able to meet personal needs that come to our attention and make plans for what we can do together as a congregation. And so we want to say thank you as your pastors, um, and we hope that you feel as a congregation a sense of pride in what we are able to do together as we really commit to the very real and good work of God in this together. As always, you can still mail a check if that is the only giving option available to you. You can also text to give. But if you have not yet done so, we invite you to sign up to give online and even do a reoccurring gift. Um, that is really the easiest way for us to process your giving during this time of social distancing. Before we move now into a time of prayer together, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot to say in our prayers today. Uh, there's a lot of things that we are feeling, hearing, reading, experiencing, uh, and we all have a myriad of emotions, and it can feel, I will confess, incredibly overwhelming to the point where it's even hard to know what to pray, what are we asking for, and how do we enter into conversation with God in this. And, even more particularly as a church, how do we pray together? As a church of the Nazarene, we are a global denomination. And um, just this week, our global leaders have called out to the churches of the Nazarene throughout the world for a day of fasting and prayer on today, Sunday, June 7. And so we are inviting you also to participate in not just this moment of prayer together in service, but to continue throughout the day to pray together and to take these words of prayer throughout uh, our week. But I wanted to, um, to say before we pray together that I, I've, um, I've taken into consideration and I've prayed a lot about even how we pray. And so I hope that as we pray these words together, um, I invite you to make this 
uh, not to use my words, but to think about this as ways that you can pray and how the Spirit might be leading us to pray about these matters um, the rest of today and throughout this week. So with all of that, would you now join me in prayer as we um, go to the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit together. So Lord, we confess that there is anger abounding. There is anger on our streets. There is anger on our news feeds. There is anger in press conferences. There is anger in our own spirits. There is anger at how people of color have been treated for 400 years on this soil. And there is anger about graffiti and looting and violence being done and perpetuated in our own city. There is anger about injustice in the criminal justice system and law enforcement. There is a lot of anger. And so we ask, holy God, that you would empower us to push our anger Godward. That we would not take it inward or outward to throw it on others, but that we would first take our anger to you. And as we do this, we ask that you would give us discernment as to know what to do with it. Jesus himself was angry. Would you guide us, God, to holy action in our anger or holy repentance? We pray specifically for leaders of our city here in Oklahoma City, our mayor, David Holt, our police chief, Wade Gurley, the leader of the OKC chapter of Black Lives Matter, T. Sheree Dickerson, and the people in our own congregation who continue to show up in the work of peaceful protest and advocacy and training in the issues of racial justice in our city. We pray that these leaders would have energy, would have courage, would have discernment to say what needs to be said to make the changes that are within their power to make and to listen well, both to one another and to your Holy Spirit. We pray for ourselves that you, Holy God, would grant us empowerment through the power of Pentecost, that we could be people who speak in a language of unity and a, a language of justice, a language of belonging, and a language of peace, not just an end to violence, although, Lord, we ask for an end to violence, but we ask for the peace that brings shalom, the fullness of life to all people. May we be a people who are a part of that happening in our midst. This is what we ask for when we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done here in Oklahoma City as it is in heaven. And we ask that you would give us whatever it is that we need to be a part of that happening. We see you at work and we want in on it, God. So with the saints of long, long past, we pray these words of the prayer of St. Francis. And we ask, Lord, that you would make us an instrument of your peace. That wherever there is hatred, Lord, on our streets, in our offices, on our Facebook pages and Twitter feeds, where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, and there is a lot, would you make us people that grant pardon? Where there is doubt, would you make us people that pave the way for faith? Where there is hope, would you make us people that are able to live in and shine? Uh, where there is despair, would you allow us to be people of hope? Where there is darkness, 
May you let us be people that live in and shine light. And where there is sadness in its abundance, would you share your joy with us that we may share it with others? Not an empty, hollow, smile on your face happiness, but a deep inner joy that comes from your abiding presence. And O oh, Divine Master, would you grant that we would not seek so much to be consoled ourselves as to console those who are grieving and mourning, who are brokenhearted, who are oppressed and burdened. Would you grant that we may not seek so much for our own way to be understood as we seek to understand one another? Would you grant that we would not so much seek to be loved ourselves as we would try and seek after your way of loving all people? For we walk in this way of Jesus that tells us it is in giving that we receive, that in pardoning we are pardoned, and that it is actually in our dying that we are born to eternal life. May you make these things true in us. Holy God, we pray. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Grace and peace to you. My name is Stephanie Rowinski. I'm a priest in the Anglican Church, and I serve as a chaplain for local businesses, helping people connect their eight to five with the story of God in their life. This morning, I'll be reading our gospel passage. It's from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and I'll be reading out of the New Revised Standard Version. So hear the word of the Lord. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together, thanks be to God. Quiero saludarte en el fuerte y poderoso nombre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo. I want to greet you in the strong and the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Chris. I get to be one of the pastors here at the 8th Street Church. And I especially want to greet you on this Trinity Sunday. Throughout history, people have grappled with how to put their experiences with this creator God into words. And that's the task of theology, to put our God experience into words. This was the challenge of the early church. The message of Jesus had just gone viral. And the church was, the church was growing at an exponential rate. So heretics and cult leaders wanted to capitalize on the big business of church growing. Many leaders claimed that they had this secret knowledge of this mysterious God, and, and in some ways, that kind of thinking still goes on today. There was a lot of confusion in those early days and theological and, and political misdirection. And as a result, the church was put in a tough position, and a lot of people were asking, what is the right way to think? And what is the wrong way? How would people know what was the right thing to believe and what was the wrong thing that they should not believe? People were making life and death decisions and they didn't want to die for the wrong things. Well, they were forced to develop and, and create a language to describe their experience with this God. Yet at the same time, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't just their own personal experience. They, they wanted to match that up, or they needed to match that up with what they saw in the scriptures and what they saw demonstrated in the person of Jesus himself. 
So finally, after years and years of debate and struggle, argument and prayer, the church agreed together and they settled on this idea that God is Trinity. One God expressed in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. This is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity. It is the foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. Trinity was a way to describe the identity of God, but it was also a way to describe the activity of God. And I would argue, and I believe that others would argue as well, that, that to be Christian is to be Trinitarian. When I was young, I was taught to just believe that God was Father, Son, and Spirit. It was just something you were supposed to do. You went to Sunday school, and then you were just supposed to believe that God was Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, poor analogies were made to try to describe it. Bad metaphors were given. I was told then after a little while, well, it's just too hard to describe. Because how do you describe something that cannot be described? God is mysterious. So how do you... How do you talk about a mystery? The doctrine of the Trinity is a mystery. But let me remind you what a mystery is. A mystery it, it can be known, a mystery can be experienced, and a mystery can, can even, to some degree, be understood. Some think that a mystery cannot be explained, but I don't, I don't think that's right. I agree with Richard Rohr when, when he suggests that a mystery just needs to be explained over and over and over again like it's a circle. Now today you may be watching and you might think, seriously, there are real issues in the world. There's protesting in the streets. People have been killed. There's political unrest, unemployment. There's complete and total exhaustion. What does it matter that God is Father, Son, and Spirit? We don't really have time to care about what the ancient church thought or, or even time to get into a history lesson. You might be even sitting there on your couch or your dinner table or wherever you're watching, and you might be even saying, I'm not interested in a college lecture. I, I'm not in that place today to talk about doctrine. I'm, I'm in no mood to philosophize. And as a pastor, I can sympathize with that. I, I've been in school for longer than I should have been. And sometimes I've recognized that theology and philosophy just lead to pontificating. There's lots of talk. There's people who are trying to sound smart. But it's, it can be really empty when there are real issues in the world. Well, why, why does it matter? I like what William Young says. He says, bad theology is like pornography. It's the imagination of a real relationship without the risk of one. There's no real trust, no experience, no intimacy, no understanding. Bad theology objectifies God. And when God is objectified, then the next logical step is that our neighbor is then objectified. Objectification means that what, whatever this is between us and God then becomes transactional and propositional rather than relational and mysterious. And Jung says bad theology victimizes and dehumanizes God and it turns the wonder and the messy mystery of intimate relationship into a centerfold to be used and then discarded. And there is a lot, a lot of bad theology floating around these days. And it has serious implications when it comes to these real-life issues. Real-life issues are why the early church fathers fought so hard for this doctrine. Our perspective of God and what we think about God carries over into the day-to-day -day practices of our life. That's why, there were, that's why there were arguments and scrapes and bruises. There were a lot of years. And this doctrine came out of their real-life experiences. It was the result of stress and persecution and, and the risk of looking foolish. And, and they sweated out while they cared for widows and orphans and others. For them, it was really important to get it right. So those early church fathers began the struggle of talking about this mystery. They did the work and, and they took the hits so that we might have a language that instills hope. They struggled. They struggled. Boy, did they struggle as they tried to work this out. 
But as my friend Brent Levine says, there is something about the struggle. Because after about 300 years of this struggle, uh, this struggle to describe the mysterious, it, it all came to a head, and there was a showdown between two men. Well, the first na man's name was Arius. He lived from about 256 to about 336 AD. And Arius was this powerful priest from a city called Alexandria, and he believed that God was omnipotent. Omnipotent just means that God is all-powerful. I believe that to be the case. We believe that God is all-powerful. But Arius thought about it like this, that God in his power was singular. He was separated from humanity and separated from creation in general. He saw that God was isolated. God is set far, far off and is apart from this created order. And Arius argued that God surpassed the ordinary and was exceptional. Well, I, I think that is the case too, that God is, uh, surpasses the ordinary and is exceptional. But his line of thinking took some dangerous turns because he said that the Son was then created by the Father. And since God was separate from his creation, he then took a stand to say that this meant the Son was less than God. And also the Spirit was created by the Son and was less than God as well. I, I drew a little picture. God, the supreme being, created the Son, who then, he said, created the Spirit. Now think about this. We as humans are always trying to posture ourselves so that it can be determined who is less than. That's the conversation on Twitter and Fox and CNN and MSNBC. To be an Aryan meant that God the Father was so unique that the Father was separate from the Son. God was, he said, Arius said, was utterly transcendent, far above the range of mere human experience. And the way that we view God is reflected in the way in which we, the way we view God is reflected in the way we carry out our practices in real life. And then, if we're thinking down his line, if God is utterly singular, separated from humanity and creation, if the Spirit is less than the Son and the Son is less than the Father, and I happen to be one of the most powerful people and stand with God Almighty, then I stand at a distance from humanity and creation as well. I, I've heard different ways that Arianism plays itself out. I've heard it like this. I've heard people say, well, we are to love the creator, but not the creation. The fact that we would have a theology whereby the creator is not entwined with creation is the perfect excuse to ravage the land of its resources and take over the planet. I have a picture here of New, uh, of New Delhi from, from just November of 2019. We could say it this way, my theology informs the way I live on this planet. I didn't know it, but I've, I was actually Aryan for most of my life. I'd read the Great Commission, and to me it felt like a kick in the head. In my mind, God didn't really have anything to do with my day-to-day -day life. I just knew that I, was com that, I, that I was commanded to tell people about this God, to believe in this God. I believed in this God. I believed in God myself, but God I saw was isolated. He was set far off. He stood so far away from me, and he stood far from his creation. God was beyond the ordinary and the exceptional. Uh, exceptional. He was too hard to reach or even know. And I wish... I wish I would have known that the early church looked at Arius and they said, absolutely not. They said his version of God was heresy. In fact, they collected a council of elders in 325 AD to make a definitive stand against Arius and other heretical ways of thinking. And they were led there at that council by another man whose name was Athanasius. Athanasius lived around 290, or he was born around 296 to 298. We're not sure when he was born, but we know he died in 373 AD. And Athanasius argued that God was an imminent, it was an imminent transcendent reality, but that God was not singular, 
but that God was plural, involved, and that God was not distant. He argued that the Son was not created, but was very God a very God, and the Spirit is none other than the one God who met Israel as Yahweh. God certainly, according to Athanasius, God certainly surpassed the ordinary and was exceptional. God is exceptional. God certainly does uh, surpass the ordinary. But he said what made God exceptional uh, was that God was not far away, but that God was close. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit were close. In fact, they were one, co-equals, co-creators, co-participants. The Trinity was close, not exceptionally far off, exceptionally close. And Athanasius said that there is this oneness, but there is also separateness in that togetherness. He argued that the Father is God, and the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is not the Spirit, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son. Do you got it? I drew a picture for you. Those in the early church, they, they were wrestling with how the Father and the Son and the Spirit existed in this relationship. So they simply described it not with words because that's so difficult to do when it comes to a mystery. But they did it with art because art reveals the mysterious without words. And so they began to speak of God this way. They said, Father, Son, and Spirit is described as a dance. They said, God dances. However, it's not just that. God is not just one who dances. God is also the dance. The rhythm, the movement, the music, the chorus, the activity, the joy, the steps, the laughter, the energy that exists between the lovers, the flow, the instruments, and the floor where the dancing takes place. All of this is seen in the triune God. In fact, the word they used to describe God was the word perichoresis. We've talked about this before here. Choresis means to dance. Peri means around. Perichoresis could be translated the great divine circle dance. But again, the mystery needs to be explained over and over and over again. We need to keep circling around as we experience this God. God, we could say, is an ongoing, moving, compelling mystery, a circle of mystery that, could be, that can be understood and known and experienced, but is to be explained over and over and over again. I teach a theology class at Southern Nazarene University, and I was, I was describing this to a student who had questions about God, and finally he told me, I, I don't think I believe in God, to which, to which I replied, so what do you believe in? And he said, I, I think the only thing that I believe in is love. And I think that is a really good place to start. Start where there is love. Because like God, love is mysterious. We know love. We can see love. We can even experience love and understand it. Love is a good starting point, which is why John said, God is love. Or we hear wherever there is love, there is, there is God. The triune God, Father, Son, Spirit, dance around perfect rhythm, perfect harmony, participating in a perfect dance of perfect outpouring, perfect love. There is a flow, a flow to this God. Father, Son, and Spirit, there is a connection one to the other. For as the energy is close within the Trinity, then it draws us close, close to this God, but then close to one another. This Trinity connects us and helps us to see and hear one another. It's a flow, a dance, that dance of love, that energy is, is connecting, and it also, while it's connecting, it heals and it repairs and it redeems. And if this is the case then we have a theology by which the creator is entwined within creation. And no longer is there ex an excuse to ravage the land of its resources and take over the planet. In fact, there is this divine energy, a flow, a love, an invitation to protect the land and then to share. Share in the resources because creation is 
God's dancing place. It's where God's energy is. The very earth is where the mystery lies. And the very energy of the dance heals and draws in and moves even in bad times. This is what New Delhi looked like in November of last year. But when COVID-19 hit, the world began to heal itself. And this is what it looked like in March of this year. That's why I think the very best Trinitarian song there is is the one that comes from Casey and the Sunshine Band. Do a, little love, uh, do a little dance, make a little love, get down tonight. It seems like that dance, the energy is an invitation then by the Trinity itself for a fourth member to get into the flow. And that fourth member is you. That fourth member is me. And even if you have royally screwed it all up, that flow can even turn that around. The Trinity is constantly moving forward, eternally making space, constantly establishing new relationships, and always healing old ones. Hum humans like to say static. We're, we're stubborn, immovable, proud. Humans create boundaries. We like individualism. The cultural drive is always towards isolation, and we call it ultimate freedom. It looks like iPhones, iPhones and hours alone in vehicles and, and drive through food service and self-checkout stations in the grocery store. Uh, the longing to be independently wealthy, sexual experience with strangers, racial profiling, online por pornography, not speaking up when another is in danger. And until COVID-19 hit, alone is what we said we preferred. We tried to convince ourselves that this is the more evolved and even safer route. But God is the dance, the energy, the rhythm, the force, the flow, where not one of the persons is less than the other, making us one as Father, Son, and Spirit are one. God is the force that moves in and around and through, connecting all things. God is the joy we feel when we've been coming out of our quarantine simply to interact with others for the first time in months. And Richard Rohr says that God, it seems, is in the business of dissolving the boundaries that we put up. This is, this is why we see that God endlessly creates and allows diversity. The reflection of the Trinity is seen in creation. When we look around, where do we see uniformity and think that that was good, God's good idea? God is, God clearly loves diversity, and, uh, and the reflection of diversity is even seen within the Godhead, God's self, Father, Son, and Spirit. These are three diverse, different, and distinct, and yet at the same time, they are one. It's, it's a mystery, a wonderful mystery. And this is what Athanasius meant when he talked about God's power. He meant that God is filling up the space and the energy that lies between us. When I was in high school, I got a C in chemistry. I was really bad at it. But I think that I've learned that the power between the protons, neutrons, and electrons isn't in those individual particles, but it is the energy in the space between the particles. Last Sunday, I, I, I marched in protest with brothers and sisters from, places, from all places and all religions and all ethnicities and all backgrounds. And as we marched, there was an energy in the space between us. It was a flow. It was connecting us to move in peace together with thousands of God's children and hear them sing in unison, what's his name? George Floyd. It was an experience that is bringing the whole country and the whole world together. It was the dance. The Trinity was there. You could feel the energy, the flow, the power. Both Arius and Athanasius argued that God was all-powerful, but while Arius said that God's power kept God distinctly separate, Athanasius said no, that God demonstrated his power by giving power away. It was always moving away. And there lies the mystery of God, because there is love. It is revealed there. It is in sacrifice and vulnerability and otherness. We see this in the very nature and the very character of the Trinity. But 
power is in the space between the three persons that hold and make those three one. The power that is in that space is love. And then that power, that energy, that flow, that love is an outflow of the one God into God's creation. This week I was with a person that was, had a meeting with a person that was just shaking in anger. It was righteous indignation. He was, he was seething. As a teacher in the heart of the city, he, he saw some of his kids on TV complete with their hoodies and backpacks as they participated in the protest. And the reporter from the helicopter commented over and over again, these guys look like trouble, even suggesting from the sky that rocks were in those bags and their intent was destruction. That anger that he felt, even God is in that energy. I wish someone would have told me about Athanasius because he along with the early church, insisted that God is Trinity. And I am invited to participate in that energy, that dance, the God flow, the love, the connection, even the righteous anger, as the Spirit is not less than the Son, and the Son is not less than the Father. I am not less than, and you are not less than. But instead, we, we are welcomed, welcomed into the flow. Trinity Sunday recognizes that the essence of God is this. It is this relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit and the relationship that we are invited into with that Holy Trinity. And we are reminded that God's power, God's energy, God's flow does not keep God at a distance, but God wants to be close and to be involved. That's why Jesus himself prayed, as you and I are one, Father, make them one. The Bible's starting point is that God is to be experienced relationally. Some scholars suggest that the first words of the scriptures in Genesis could be translated, in the beginning, relationship. Well, Arian believed that the Son was created from the Father, as well as the Spirit was created from the Son. That's really bad theology, and it plays out in real time. We can mess up the Trinity and jump into the pornography trap, objectifying God, and thereby dehumanizing others with this Trinitarian hierarchy that he shows us. Have, have you ever seen or heard this before? A, a, a single-minded, father-like ruler demands that an expediently dispatched son use his immense power or force to batter and break humanity. This week, I watched in horror as Bull Connor turned hoses and dogs on people protesting. Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't Bull Connor. And it wasn't hoses and dogs. It was tear gas and rubber bullets in front of the St. John's Church. Bad theology objectifies God. And then it is the pathway to objectify others. Stephanie read the Gospel of Matthew for us, and Matthew begins his gospel by telling us about Jesus' family. It's a genealogy, which demonstrates that there is a relationship there. And it would seem that he ends in that same way with Stephanie's reading, an invitation into the Trinity relationship, relationship into a new family that comes through baptism. The early church insisted that candidates be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It was a symbolic way to enter into the Trinity flow. Well, in some churches, they make sure that the water is moving when they baptize the baptismal candidate because it is in the flow where healing can begin and the Trinity would begin to move those persons forward. Now, there's nothing magical about the water per se, but the magic, the mystery, is in the presence of the Trinity and how the Trinity mysteriously invites people in those baptism waters, through those baptism waters into healing and invites them to embrace and then reflect the Trinity's way of power and dance and energy and flow. And as we participate in that flow, in our baptism, we gradually turn into the image we reflect. If you have been baptized and you have never considered what your baptism means, I'd, I'd like you to be thinking about that this week. 
you have been immersed into a new, mysterious flow. And if you have never been baptized, I'd love to talk to you about entering into that flow, the flow of the Trinity through baptism, so that you might be able to realize and know the new connection and joy that comes from being immersed in the very essence of God. Baptism is a mystery, and while, while I can try to describe the experience of my baptism, it has to be explained over and over and over again. It's like a wonderful circle. The perfect harmony, the perfect relationship, the perfect community is drawing us in even when we don't realize it. And Matthew ends his book by saying all are invited into this family, into this God relationship. That's why Jesus says the very authority of the Father is mine. The very power of the Spirit is mine. And this power that I have means that you are not alone and you are not powerless in the world because I am with you always. The Trinity is God as eternal relationship, healing and loving and moving and being. The Trinity is the rhythm of the new creation. The Trinity is the flow that heals our brokenness. The Trinity fills the space in between, the space where words are not needed, but connection can be made. The Trinity is the force that draws us to God and then to one another. The Trinity is the power of love that is given to us so that we might forgive. The Trinity is what pulls us into reconciliation. The Trinity is the empowering fellowship that we are one with God. The Trinity is the urging, the moving towards participation in Trinity-like activities of healing, mercy, and justice. The Trinity is active goodness in a world of total despair. The Trinity is the work of divine hospitality calling us to come and see what God is up to. The Trinity is constantly making room. The Trinity is eternally moving forward towards our gift. Whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, baptism puts you into the uncontrollable flow of this holy trinity. Amen. Our next candidate for baptism is Watson. Watson Christopher Pollock. Watson, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now Watson receive the grace and the healing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the power of the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born to God in the Spirit, you may be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Our next candidate for baptism. So each week as we conclude, we are sent. We don't just end. We are sent with an invitation to continue in this way that we have heard. And so this week, our practice is that we would practice the art of listening. This listening in relationship, this listening of the dance, this listening of the Trinity, in which we learn to listen well to one another. So you will find some ideas of how you can take this practice into your week in your email tomorrow morning. You will also find it posted um, on our social media. In just a minute, we'll have an announcement video at the conclusion of our service that we really are excited to share with you about some ways that we have to be together in the coming weeks. And so we would like for you to um, stick around and watch Pastor Andrea tell us about that. But before we sing our final song in worship, I want to invite you to receive these words of benediction. So friends, may you know the fullness of the love of the Father, the joy, the sacrifice, the energy of the Son, 
and the perpetual movement and invitation of the Spirit. May you go in this dance with Father, Son, and Spirit everywhere you go. Amen. Pastor Andrea, and I'm coming to you with a very exciting announcement. March 8th, um, about three months ago, was the last time that we were able to meet together and come to the table. And that is far too long. Um, we are still not going to be able to all meet together in one location, but we want to make sure that we're able to connect as much as possible. And so we are going to have neighborhood gatherings in which you can come to the table and have communion and worship together in a service that will be around 20 minutes or less. And we're going to be meeting in five locations between June 9th and June 21st. Those locations are Riverbend Park, Waymans Park, Elden Lion Park, Mesta Park. And then on June 21st, we'll be having a gathering on the 8th Street Church lawn. So it's very important that you RSVP because we can only accommodate 30 people per location. But for some reason, if your neighborhood location is full, you can go to another one. Just make sure you RSVP. And if all the neighborhood locations fill up, you are always welcome to come to the 8th Street Church Lawn on June 21st. We're really excited to be able to see you in person for a safe social distance gathering in which we can come to the table and worship together. I hope you have a great week. Grace and peace to you.